بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله عز وجل says in the Quran, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasib al Nasu ay Yutraku ay Yakulu Amanna wahum la yuftanun. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alif Lam Mim, do people think that they will be left alone because they say we believe and will not be tested? And we indeed tested those who were before them. And Allah will certainly make it known the truth of those who are true and will certainly make it known the falsehood of those who are liars. Although Allah Azza wa Jal knows all that before putting them to test. It is indeed part of Allah's religion that each and every one of us would be tested. We will go through trials. We will go through testings and calamities so that we would prove to be worthy of Allah's paradise or not. This is the way of da'wah that all the messages and prophets of Allah had gone through. Beginning from Adam, and we know his test, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, all the great prophets and messengers of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they went through this. And in this life, when we have minerals, when we have metals, when we have precious things, it has to go under process. When you have gold, you have to put it in a process that would purify it from impurities. And then you would have the real gold away from the impurities. Now, the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, that when Allah loves people, He severely tests them. And this is a sign of Allah's love to the people. And Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, told us that he visited the Prophet والسلام, once when he was sick. And he put his hand on the Prophet's chest and he felt the heat coming out of it. And he said, O Prophet of Allah, we talk among ourselves and say that you usually get sick twice as much as any other person. And the Prophet said, yes, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He said, the most sorely tested among all the creation of Allah are the Prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then those who are next best and the next best. A man is tested in accordance to his level of religious commitment. If his religious commitment is strong, he will be tested accordingly. But if his religious commitment is weak, he will be tested in accordance with his religious commitment. Now, the one million dollar question. Who's the most person with the best and strongest religion, religious commitment on earth, it's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when we go through his biography, when we go through his seerah, we will find this clear to us. Unfortunately, the time does not allow me to elaborate, yet I will try my level best. To summarize 63 years of his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the trials that he had faced, I'll try my level best to give it to you in less than 
35 minutes. And it's an impossible task. But we will just scan through because we would need a lot of days and weeks and months simply to study his biography, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. These trials that he had gone through, these sufferings that he had lived since he was born, all of this so that you would enjoy the religion that you are enjoying at the moment, so that you would find the sweetness of Iman when you pray in submissiveness to the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is what he had done for you, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And when you ever hear his name, offer salam to him so that you may be with him on the day of judgment. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, his father died when his mother was pregnant with him. So he, he did not see his father. His mother also died when he was six years of age. So when every child in Mecca had someone to take care of him, had someone to hug him and cuddle him, our Prophet ﷺ did not enjoy this when he was a young child. After his mother died, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, took care of him. So for two years, he had something to go to. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal tested him again and again, and his grandfather died. So his uncle, Abu Talib, took care of him. But Abu Talib was so poor that he could barely support his own children. So the Prophet ﷺ was raised in an environment of poverty and need. And with what was worse is that his uncle, his beloved uncle died as a disbeliever, as a kafir. And this is one of the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. Imagine if the Prophet ﷺ uncle was a Muslim. He could not have protected him because the pagans, the idol worshippers, would have attacked him and his uncle. But because he was kafir, he was able to protect the Prophet ﷺ. All of this, the death of his father, his mother, his grandfather, his uncle, all of this so that his heart would only be connected to Allah Azza wa Jal and would be in need of Allah Azza wa Jal and no one else. Exactly like Allah Azza wa Jal had done with Ibrahim after so many years of having no children and then being blessed with this child, Ismail, just as he was few weeks old, Allah tells him to take him and his mother to Mecca and leave them. And Allah Azza wa Jal also tests him again when he is like 14 or 15 years of age. Allah tests him to slaughter him. All tests from Allah Azza wa Jal. And you think that you're being tested? You think that you're going through trials and calamities in life? When you compare this to their trials and calamities, wallahi, we are being favored and blessed by Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grew up poor. So he used to take care of people's sheep. He was a shepherd for few dinars or few dirhams. And he was known among the people to be the trustworthy, the honest. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And life seemed to be open up, opening up a little bit for him. This wise and rich, this beautiful woman proposes through her friend to him. So he marries one of the four best women ever to walk the earth. And she was Khadija, bint Khuwailid, may Allah be pleased with her. As he was about to enjoy life, Allah Azza wa Jal sends him the real joy. Allah Azza wa Jal chooses him to be his messenger. And Allah speaks to him, Ya ayyuhal muddathir, O you who are wrapped in your garments, in your blankets, 
قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Raise up and give the warning to the people. And since that day, he had never slept alayhi salatu wasalam for straight hours. He kept on giving da'wah as Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him to do so. So Allah chose him to be the messenger. But trials after trials kept coming in. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was fiercely attacked and taken as an enemy by the closest of his relatives. Abu Lahab, his uncle, he was his fierce enemy. He ordered his two sons to divorce the Prophet's daughters. Imagine when you're a father and you have two daughters that you love and care for and they're divorced because you are calling people to Allah and trying to save them from hell. How do you feel as a father when your daughters come divorced? Not only that, he used to run after the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever he goes to a tribe calling them to Islam, he tells them, I'm his uncle. He's a liar. Don't believe him. Subhanallah. When a stranger does this to you, this might be acceptable. But when your uncle does it to you, how did he feel, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? One, while going through this seerah, feels depressed. So how about the person who's going through this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So now he's calling people to Islam. After being the truthful and trustworthy, now he is the liar. He is the insane. He is the sorcerer. He is the priest. And they kept on giving him labels and names. And this was the most difficult to him. Because your integrity, your dignity, this is what you have, the most valuable thing you can have. Yet they kept on doing this and slandering him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They used to even do it physically. So whenever they see him in Mecca, they would choke him with his clothes when they can. If they see him walking, they would spit in his face, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the extent that once he was prostrating in haram, in Kaaba, and they brought the guts and intestines and the filth of a camel that was slaughtered, and they put it on his back, his head, and his head. And the Prophet did not move, alayhi salatu wasalam. He kept on prostrating until Fatima, may Allah be pleased with her, and she was a young a, a, a child, came after hearing that, and she removed it, and she cleared his back, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, cursing them and shouting at them. And the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, raised his head. And he supplicated against them. Saying, Oh Allah, destroy Quraysh, destroy Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybah ibn Rabi'ah, Abu Jahl, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, uh, Uqba ibn Abi Ma'id. He started naming them one by one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thirteen years in Mecca, he was not allowed to raise a knife, let alone a sword. He was not allowed to defend himself. Jihad was not permitted. For 13 years, they've been bombarding him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with everything that they can just to break him down. What trials one need more to be suffering? Whenever the Prophet ﷺ gave da'wah to someone, they would take that person and torture him, trying to break him down and trying to make him go back on his deen. He used to go in the streets of Mecca. What would he hear, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He would hear the cries of his beloved one. Ala Yasir, Ammar, Yasir, Sumayya. He would see Bilal being tortured in the, in, in the middle of the day, under the heat of the sun. All what he says is, Ahadun Ahad. This is what the Prophet used to see, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khabbab comes to him and says, Prophet of Allah, supplicate for us. Let us do something. And he would give them the glad tidings that Allah would make his religion prevail. And they look around and all what they can do is believe. 
How can the religion of Allah prevail and we're being tortured and punished like this? And then they forced him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to allow his loved ones, his companions, his friends to migrate. And he tells them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, go to Abyssinia. There is a king that treats people with fairness and justice. So they leave. They migrate twice to Abyssinia. And he is on his own, trying to call people to Islam. Until they forced him to go out of Mecca. Aisha says, may Allah be pleased with her. O Prophet of Allah, have you ever seen a day worse than the day of Uhud? He said, yes. What can be worse than the day of Uhud? When 70 of his close companions, when his uncle was butchered, when his close companions were killed and mutilated with their nose cut off, with their ears cut off, hung in a string at the end of the day. What could be worse? The Prophet tells us that he went to Taif, which is, which is about 50 kilometers uphill from Mecca. And he tried to give da'wah to them. He tried to call them so that they would back him up. Yet they ridiculed him. They made fun of him. And not only that, they ordered their slaves and youngsters to throw stones at him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they made his feet bleed. The best of Allah's creation is being treated in this way? Yes, because you cannot have gold until you burn it. And the Prophet went down 50 kilometers. He said, I was so depressed, I did not wake up except in Qarn al-Tha'alib, which is about 30 to 40 kilometers on his feet, bleeding feet. He did not wake up, meaning that he was walking without knowing where he was going, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what was the result? Allah sends the angel of the mountains and says, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah tells me, to do whatever you instruct me to do. So if you wish these two great mountains surrounding this village, I'll collapse them on top of their heads and I'll annihilate them. If I were in his shoes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would have said, be my guest, but not the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not our beloved Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. He said, no, I pray to Allah that from their offspring, there will come people that say, la ilaha illallah which means that his da'wah, that his call, that his mission was not for him, for him personally. It was for Allah, the Almighty, Azza wa Jal. The idol worshippers surrounded him in Shi'b Abi Talib in one part of Mecca for three years, not allowing any food, any provisions to come through till they ate the leaves of the trees just to stay alive. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas tells us about this period of time. He said that I was urinating once and I heard something that my urine fell on. So I looked at it and found that it is a camel's skin, something that is like ages old. So I took it, and I cleaned it, and I washed it, and I cooked it, and I ate it. And it gave me strength for three days. Three years, and the Prophet and his companions were surrounded in that place. And the biggest catastrophe that the Prophet faced afterwards was the death of his beloved wife Khadija and the death of his supporter Abu Talib in one year. And that year was known to be the year of grief. And Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to condole and console his prophet. So Allah gave him the honor of reaching a place where no human had ever reached. And that is the seventh heaven. When he came back, he told 
the idol worshippers that I've been to Jerusalem, Beit al-Maqdis, and al-Masjid al-Aqsa, and I've prayed uh, uh, there, and I led the prayer with all the prophets and messengers, and then I was ascended to the seventh heaven. Did they believe him? Never. They said, okay, describe the Masjid al-Aqsa. And a man who came for a few minutes or maybe an hour or two, and it was night, how would he describe such a place? So Allah Azza wa Jal raised the masjid until the Prophet could see it, والسلام, and he started to describe it gate by gate, window by window, brick by brick. And they knew that he was telling the truth. When they saw that it was this serious, they decided to assassinate him. And they forced him, alayhi salatu wasalam, to migrate to Medina. And they were pursuing him. And they had a posse to follow him. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal saved him from their plans. When he reached Medina, was it time for him to relax? Never. The trials kept on coming to him. He suffered immensely, alayhi salatu wasalam, from the plotting of the Jews who were trying to do their level best to kill him and those with him. They went to Mecca, they plotted. They went to the tribes of Arabia, they plotted. They did whatever they can do to harm him and his da'wah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And he also suffered from the hypocrites. The hypocrites who tried to also join hands and forces with the Jews. The Jews tried to assassinate him so many times, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know about the sheep that a woman invited him for, and she filled it up with poison. After Allah's victory on Badr, he fought the idol worshippers in Uhud. And then, only to be shocked to lose his uncle, to lose his brother, because Hamza is the brother of the Prophet والسلام, through suckling. And he was gutted and he was mutilated. Mus'ab ibn Umayr, his messenger to the people of Medina was also martyred. So he swore by Allah to mutilate 70 of the disbelievers. Once Allah Azzawajal grants him power over them and Allah tells him, no, you're not allowed to do this. It is not up to you to mutilate or to kill, or to annihilate. You just do what Allah tells you to do. In the Battle of Uhud, the best human ever to walk the earth, the best of Allah's creation, gets his cheek wounded. And two of the rings of his shield is into his head. His tooth is broken, and he bleeds, alayhi salatu wasalam. The hypocrites make fun of him make fun of the companions, plot to destroy Islam. In Uhud, those who went to fight the idol worshippers, one third of them were hypocrites. Once they saw the enemies of Islam, they retreated, leaving the Prophet ﷺ and those with him. And imagine what impact this had on the people's feelings and their enthusiasm to fight the disbelievers. When the Prophet ﷺ gave the glad tidings to the Muslims when they were surrounded in the battle of the trench, Al-Khandaq, he's giving them, once he is breaking that big stone that intercepted their way, while he's breaking it, he says, Allahu Akbar, I can see the palaces of the kings of Persia, of the kings of Yemen, of the kings of Asham, of the kings of Byzantium. And Allah Azza wa Jal would give me their treasures and their lands. The hypocrites laugh and say, we cannot go and answer the call of nature and he is promising us these treasures. This is the exact role of the hypocrites in the Ummah of Islam until day, today. They try to put you down. They try to discourage you. They try to make you leave Islam, to have a new religion. 
a Western Islam where everything goes. This is the role of the hypocrites that the Prophet ﷺ used to fight. On the personal level, Alayhi salatu wasalam faced many trials. On his personal and family level, all of his children died in his lifetime except for Fatima. May Allah be pleased with her. His male children died before reaching the age of puberty. And the last one of them was Ibrahim. When the Prophet ﷺ was about 60 years of age, Allah blesses him with this beautiful child, Ibrahim, and he loves him. Whenever he sees him, he cuddles him, he smells him, he kisses him. Allah Azza wa Jal does not allow the Prophet's heart to be shared by anyone else. So Allah Azza wa Jal make this child fall sick, and then he dies. And he dies while the Prophet والسلام, is carrying him. How would the Prophet feel وسلم, after all these years being blessed with a child and then he sees the child die while he's carrying him? What does he say? He say, والسلام, the eye sheds tears and the heart is saddened but the tongue does not utter except what pleases Allah and by Allah on departing you Ibrahim we are saddened and that is it because he knows it is all from Allah Azza wa Jal his three daughters die in front of him Ruqayya the wife of Uthman dies on the second year of Hijrah he gives her sister Umm Kalthum to Uthman and she dies as well on the ninth year of Hijrah and he said, by Allah, if I had a third daughter, I would have given it to Uthman. May Allah be pleased with him. And then Zainab dies a year before, on the eighth year of Al-Hijrah. May Allah be pleased with her. And Fatima, the last one, he tells her that six months after I die, you will soon join me. When you look at his life and compare it to our lives, we live in a life of prosperity. And we are rich. The Prophet Alaihi's life was hard. He had never had a full stomach of bread for three days. And the fire would not be lit. They would not cook in nine of his homes for two consecutive months. They would not cook. And Urwa ibn Zubair asked his aunt Aisha, what did you feed on? She said, nothing except water and dates. Try to do this for, for a diet for two days or three days and see if you can bear this or not. The guests come to the Prophet ﷺ. So he sends to nine of his houses. Can you host my guest? Do we have food? And they send back to him, by Allah, we have only water and dates. We have no food. The wives of the Prophet ﷺ don't have food. He used to tie two pieces of rock so that he could have his back straight. Because when you're starving, you walk a little bit bent. The Prophet used to put two big stones and he would, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fast days without end because he did not have food and because he was fasting and continuing to fast, to fast three or four or five days in a row without breaking fast as this is something special for him to worship Allah Azza wa Jal with. His house, did he live in a big mansion? No. His house, a man of normal height could not stand straight. He had to bend because the ceiling was low. And when the Prophet used to pray night prayer, alayhi salatu wasalam, his room with Aisha, and this is the house they had, it did not have enough place for him to pray. So Aisha used to sleep in front of him. And whenever he wanted to prostrate, he would touch her so she would wake up and pull away her legs so that he can prostrate. And when he stands back, she extends them back again. The trials in his, his marital life are so apparent, but we cannot feel it. When he was married to Khadija, may Allah be pleased with him, May Allah be pleased with her. 
he was a king, a true king. Why? Because Allah gave her the glad tiding of a house made of a big pearl. And in this house, she will not hear any loud noises and she would not work. The scholars say, because this is exactly what she did to the Prophet ﷺ. He would go into the house, he would be a king. He would not do a single thing. And he, no noise, nagging, shouting would be in that house. So he was a king. And when she died, may Allah be pleased with her. He tells us, or, or, or his wives tell us, that whenever the Prophet ﷺ went into his house, he used to fix his sandals, stitch his thaw, milk his goat, meaning that he used to work in his house. He would do that willingly. Khadija would never allow him to do that because he was her king and she was indeed his queen. He loved Khadija, a love that you could not find in the best of love novels, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the extent that in the battle of Badr, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'i, the husband of Zainab, his daughter, was captured. And the Prophet sent to Mecca, give me your ransom so that I would send away, send you back the prisoners of war. Zainab did not have anything to pay for the ransom of her husband. And she sent a medallion, a necklace, that her mother Khadija gave her on her wedding day. And she sent it to the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet saw it, he felt emotionally obliged to address the Muslims. And he told them, listen, he is like any other prisoner. But if you, for me, would let him free, then I would appreciate that. And the Muslims immediately on the spot said, oh, Prophet of Allah, he's yours. So he sent him to his daughter and Abu al-As sent Zainab back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved Khadija so much, even after her death, he would always remember her with the good memories he had with her. Once her sister Hala bint Khuwailid sought permission to come in. And when the Prophet heard her salam, he said, Allahumma Hala, the sister of Khadija, and this was years after her death, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, felt jealous. Aisha was a youngster. She was a teenager. She was the beloved wife of the Prophet. So she said, O oh Prophet of Allah, you still remember this old woman whose mouth is red because all of her teeth fell down. While Allah has substituted you, while Allah has replaced you with someone who's much better than her, and the Prophet was outraged. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, she believed in me when people said I'm a liar. She gave me shelter when people would not accept me. She compensated me with her wealth when people deprived me and Allah granted me children from her when all of you could not bear children. Aisha said, by Allah, I will never mention her with any ill thoughts or words after today. So forgive me, O Prophet of Allah. On the personal level, the Prophet ﷺ, with his wives, who are the mothers of the believers, they came to a stage where they could not take it anymore. And they said, we have to have more provision. We have to have food. And they're asking for money. So the Prophet ﷺ took a whole month in exclusion. He secluded himself in the masjid for a whole month until Allah Azza wa Jal gave them the choice whether to seek divorce or to be happy with their life 
lives with him, and they chose the Prophet ﷺ. On the financial level, the Prophet ﷺ was extremely rich, but not of his own wealth. He would not spend a single penny on himself. He used to get the booties of war from all over, and the people would chase him literally until his cloak would fall off his shoulders, asking for money. And he said, people, take it easy. By Allah, I'm not misery, and I will not keep anything for myself. Uh, everything that I have is yours. And he used to distribute everything to the Muslims, keeping nothing to him. Yet, this would not prevent the people from harming him. Walking with Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, a nomad comes from behind him, grabs him from his cloak, and pulls him, and, and this should frighten people when you're walking without anticipating anyone to do this to you. And he does that, hurting his back until it became red, saying, Muhammad, give me from the money you have. It's not your money, it's Allah's money. And the Prophet smiles, alayhi salatu wasalam, and he says to his people, give him money. One of the khawarij, and we have a handful of them nowadays, one of these khawarij takfiris says to the Prophet ﷺ when he was dividing and giving the booties of war to the people, he said, be fair, fear Allah. This is not the way that a division pleases Allah. And the Prophet looks at him, Allah Azzawajal entrusted me with the wahi, the revelation, and you're telling me to be fair? If I'm not fair, who's fair on earth? Not only that, even his companions at times, we're not very happy of the way he used to divide the booties of war. In the battle of Hunayn, when Allah Azza wa Jal granted more than 30,000 sheep and 7,000 camels and so much wealth to the Prophet ﷺ, he did not take a single thing back with him. He called the new Muslims of Quraysh who just accepted Islam to evade being slaughtered. He gave Sufyan, he gave Abu Sufyan ibn Harb a hundred camel. Al-Aqra ibn Habis, Uyayna ibn Hassan. They, he started giving them a hundred camels, a hundred camels. And he didn't give the Ansar a single thing. So Sa'd ibn Ubadah comes to the Prophet and says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, our people are talking. And they say that Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa these are the Ansar. Yet, they're humans. And they say that you have met your family, your relatives, your tribesmen, and you're favoring them with the booties of war and depriving us, the Ansar, who have been with you for eight years. You're depriving us from giving us even a single sheep or a camel. So the Prophet looks at Sa'ad and said, what do you say? Okay, you're a close friend of mine, Sa'ad. How do you feel? And Sa'ad says, I am one of my people, O Prophet of Allah. Even you, Sa'ad. So he says, gather the Ansar in one location and not a single one from out of the Ansar. No Muhajireen, nobody, only the Ansar. So they collect, he, they collect, uh, he collects them in a big stable and the Prophet addresses them, alayhi salatu wasalam, angrily. And he says, oh Ansar, what have you said about me? Didn't I come to you when you were astray and Allah guided you through me? Didn't I come to you when you were poor and Allah made you rich through me? Didn't I come to you when you were enemies killing one another and Allah united you through me? And all what the Ansar used to say was, the favor is to Allah and to his messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The favor is to Allah and to his messenger. We cannot say anything. So the Prophet says, won't you respond to what I'm saying? And they said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what do you want us to say? The favor is to Allah and to you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, if you were to say, you would be saying the truth. You could have said, you came to us migrating and we have given you shelter. You came to us when people said that you're a liar and we believed in you. You came to us weak and we gave you strength and fought side by side to you. You could have said that, but wouldn't it be 
best for you that people go to their homes with sheep and camel while you go back to your kids with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Wouldn't you like that? By Allah, if it wasn't for migration from Mecca to Medina, I would have been one of the Ansar. The Ansar are the close garment that I wore, wear to my body and the people are a blanket that does not touch my skin. By Allah, if the Ansar would have to cross a valley, I would have crossed it with them. Oh Allah, forgive the Ansar and the sons of the Ansar and the sons of the sons of the Ansar. And the whole people were filled with crying and their tears filled their beards and said, we accept the Prophet ﷺ as our provision. We take him with us. So even his closest friends, his closest companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at times did not accept the way he gave the money to those whom he thought best that it would benefit them more than his own companions. The Prophet ﷺ used to pray night prayer until his feet were swollen. After all these trials, one would expect him to go back to his bed and sleep for a good six or eight hours. The Prophet would spend the night praying and asking Allah Azza wa for guidance for you, his ummah. He would ask Allah Azza wa for forgiveness for you, his ummah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He would sleep on a bed that was so rough it used to affect his side. It used to leave traces on his side. And Umar would come and cry. And he said, you are the messenger of Allah. You are the best of Allah's creation. And the people, the rulers, the kings of Persia and of the Romans are in their palaces while you're sleeping on such a bed. And the Prophet ﷺ would only say to him, don't you, don't you want them to enjoy this life while the hereafter is ours? Aisha tells him, O oh Prophet of Allah, you pray until your feet are swollen. Didn't Allah forgive your previous and upcoming sins? He said, yes. But shouldn't I be grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal? Being forgiven, does this mean that I can do whatever I want? The Prophet wasalam, used to attend 24-7 all the calls he had. So whenever someone wanted to speak to him, whenever someone invited him, whenever someone wanted him to reconcile between him and another person, he would attend. Till he got to the point where he could not pray standing up. Mother Aisha says, radiallahu anha, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, prayed, did not pray sitting down until the people overwhelmed him. So many questions, so many problems, so many cases, he could not bear the time or to have free time until he prayed sitting down, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we conclude by him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, suffering for the last time in his life. For two weeks, he fell, he fell sick. And the companions of the Prophet say that the reason of his sickness and illness was the traces of the poison he still finds. And he died because of that, as some scholars say. He suffered a lot until his death time. He used to lie down, feeling sick, with a pot of water next to him putting his hand into it and washing his face and says, La ilaha illallah, death has stoppers to it. Inna lil mawti sakarat. And the last thing she heard the Prophet ﷺ say before he died, Allahumma rafiq al-a'la, pointing upwards, saying that, no, I would like to, instead of being here immortal on earth and enjoying Life, I'd rather be with Allah the Almighty. In one and in another interpretation, I'd rather be with the righteous messengers and prophets of Allah Azza wa Jal, as a Rafiq al-A'la has both meanings. 
So the Prophet wasallam suffered. The Prophet wasallam had great trials only so that this religion would reach you and for you to enjoy it and inshallah afterwards to enjoy paradise due to your good deeds. Now the question would be, what in return have we presented to the beautiful religion of Islam so that we would justify the trials of the Prophet ﷺ? This is your responsibility. This is my responsibility. After going through the trials of the Prophet ﷺ, that we acknowledge the fact that we cannot be leaders in Islam. We cannot be imam in Islam until we face similar trials, until we suffer for the sake of Allah in accordance to the Quran and to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam. Wallahu A'lam wa nisbatul ilmi ilayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakan abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina Muhammad.